Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marie Dunn, and I'm a second year student in the Health Policy and Management program here at Harvard School of Public Health. I'm also here representing our Women in Leadership student organization. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to present our distinguished guest for this afternoon's event, Yana Angelopoulos. A lawyer by training and a former member of parliament, she's currently serving in an international role as the Greek ambassador. Ambassador Angelopoulos is well known for her work on the 2004 Summer Olympic Games in Athens. In 2000, when slow progress put Athens in danger of losing the Summer Games, Yana was asked to assume the presidency of the Athens 2004 Organizing Committee. Under her leadership, Athens made up for lost time and gave the world what the International Olympic Committee president called an unforgettable dream games. As President Clinton has noted, from Crete to Athens and Zurich to London, Yana Angelopoulos has made a career of turning ideas into action. She's recently published a book about her experience called My Greek Drama, Life, Love, and One Woman's Olympic Effort to Bring Glory to Her Country. Today, Ambassador Angelopoulos is an active member of the Clinton Global Initiative. She also serves as the vice chairperson of the Dean's Council for Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. She helped to lead the Kennedy School Symposium titled The Greek Paradox, which examined ways in which Greece could close the gap between promise and performance in the political, economic, and foreign policy fields. Perhaps unsurprisingly, she's been named one of the 50 most powerful women in the world by Forbes magazine. Ambassador Angelopoulos is also a wife and mother of three, and she lives in Athens, Greece with her family. Before I turn the seminar over to Dean Frank, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Angelopoulos to Harvard School of Public Health and to the Decision-Making Voices from the Field Leadership Series. Thank you, Marie, for, for that introduction. Welcome, welcome to the Decision-Making Voices from the Field Leadership Discussion Series. We're really excited today to have Ambassador Gianna Angelopoulos of Greece as our guest speaker. I'm particularly delighted to introduce her because many of you may not know that in addition to being the Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, I am proudly the TNG Angelopoulos Professor of Public Health and International Development. Uh, Theodore Angelopoulos and Gianna Angelopoulos uh, generously endowed a chair for a joint position between the Harvard School of Public Health and the Kennedy School, and I am very proud to be the occupant of that uh, position. So I have a very special link to the Angelopoulos family, and we're delighted to have an extraordinary leader exactly to illustrate the purpose of this series. This series was in designed to bring together outstanding leaders in different areas of life, not just health related, but a broader spectrum of uh, public service positions, and to tell us, to share with us their experiences in the actual exercise of leadership. Um, over the now the two years of this series, over half a million people have watched this uh, set of interviews and uh, reflections on some of the really stellar figures of our times, reflecting on what it is to be a leader. So we're, we're really delighted um, to, to have uh, such an outstanding person uh, be our guest uh, today. Uh, this discussion is being webcast um, uh, worldwide. Uh, we do hope that our online audience uh, will enjoy this conversation as much as our studio audience, which is mostly composed of students, bright students like Marie and others uh, from our Harvard School of Public Health, and also uh, faculty members. We're particularly delighted uh, that the Women in Leadership group of our student body uh, has been particularly active in inviting women in positions of leadership to, to tell us also about that, the, the, the special challenges that they face. This is a very special year for the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, be, we are celebrating our centennial, our 100th anniversary. And, um, and for us, the decision-making voice from the field series for this year will have a special meaning because it's the centennial uh, year. So what are better way uh, to celebrate than to welcome Ambassador Angelopoulos? As Marie said, she has just published a book. Uh, it is uh, now a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today bestseller. Uh, it's a fascinating read. And uh, for the studio audience, we will have copies at the end uh, at the back of the room. And for our webcast audience, 
you can get this book <laughs> in many places. It's a, it's a fascinating read. Uh, so let me, um, without further ado, uh, ask Ambassador Angelopoulos to come here and to first share with us some of her reflections on, on, on how is it that tough decisions are made and maybe to give us some examples. And after that, um, she will be kind enough to answer questions, so think about your questions, and I'm sure we are going to have an extraordinary uh, conversation this afternoon. Diana, over to you. All said, shall I ask, shall I receive some questions now? <laughs> Everything that I have to say prior to me. So of course I'm proud, Julio, to be here. Of course I'm proud uh, to help you through our chair uh, between Kennedy School and uh, School of Public Health, to help you project your work and in a way to connect talents like these people with abilities in a way to put an extra stone on the building of connecting countries together and facing the shared problems. This is my satisfaction, and also a chair like this that I have home. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about uh, leadership lessons. My first lesson is that sometimes moments of opportunity come when you least expect them. And you have to see them. So, going back in 1996, living in London, happily with my family, I received a phone call. It was a minister of culture and sports in Greece. If we were at that time, we should Google and see who is here. I had no idea about his name. In a pompous way, he asked me over the phone, Mr. Angelopoulos, the Prime Minister of Greece, proposes that you will participate in the bid committee. I say, what bid committee? <laughs> he said, the bid committee for the 2004 Olympic Games. That was all news to me. Several years ago, Greece felt humiliated because lost the competition to Atlanta for the Centennial Games. Greece faced the whole competition in a very arrogant way, no news, of course, at the time. Uh, they presented our case like we deserved that. It was our right because of our heritage and Olympic Games and so on. The IOC, of course, felt differently, and the Greeks, they were deeply embarrassed um, when the games they were awarded to Atlanta, Georgia. I knew that if Greece was going to have a chance of winning the 2004 games, uh, we had to follow a different way, a completely different strategy. We had to win by merit and not by right. And that was very important to me. to change the strategy, I mean. But if I had to be in charge, I needed to be just the top. And allow me to say, it's not because I'm a megalomaniac. It's <laughs> because I believe leaders don't seek titles, but they do seek results. And. I never agreed, you know, apart from Harvard, let's say, to serve on a committee uh, and just to be a member of the board and uh, just a big title, except if they give me the authority to do some, to have some action, to do some work. And this is what I'm doing here. Now, let's say, bid committee. I could start with so many things. I could tell about the games themselves. Uh, I could write a book that I wrote, <laughs> and you're welcome to have a copy later. And I've done that bestseller. Thank you very much, America. <laughs> and um, I'll give you a taste, just a taste. So, 
call from the Prime Minister of Greece. Just over a year for the BD process. All the others, they were well in advance. All the, others compet all the other competitors. I was named president. My team and I, we had a lot of work to do to change the strategy. We had to make our case to the International Olympic Committee why we were qualified to have the Games. Not just we visited every country upon the rules, not just we received everybody, and in the spirit of Philoxenia, Theodore and I, my husband, we insisted to have them every night and dinner. Imagine me working all day round, working with the agencies, with the government, and then in the evening to be the very pleasant hostess, you know, having a different menu every day because we didn't want them to feel that they are just a part of the group, have a different music every day, have uh, amenities for them in their hotels. Uh, do they like the piano? Let's uh, have a baby grand. Do they like to pray? I mean, let's have the special rug. Uh, do they want uh, uh, pistachios? Um, do they like Greek food or Greek wine? Everything, everything. And I say that we had to court 107 members at the time of the IOC, because, guys, it's all about human relations. Big cases, big projects. Allow me to say, forget the ads. Forget the campaigns that they reach hundreds of thousands and millions of people. If you want to win your case, you have to be personally there, you and your team or teams, and you have to appear and build human relations. This is something that I paid off during all my life. The thing that I regret is when I didn't, or I forgot, or I let somebody else, and I didn't have the chance even to oppose somebody. So, visits, IOC visits, and the great visits of the IOC members, they were that they should go to a special park that we created for them and plant an olive tree, symbol of friendship, of peace, of connection, and of course the symbol of the city of Athens and of goddess Athena. The city was named after her name. The challenge for me as a president was to commit to an approach and stay focused to our core strategy. For us, it was one day at a time, one member at a time, one national committee at a time to make the case for Athens. And we won the bid. We were the underdog. Another lesson for leadership. Sometimes it's better not to wish to be named as a favorite. Do your work, approach your goal, and let them name you as winner just at the end. We were the underdog. Rome was the favorite at the time. So, we won the games, but a bidding committee is a completely different thing than the organizing committee. The Prime Minister, of course, a socialist, I was belonging to the Conservative Party, not anymore, of course. I mean, as a character, I'm more radical than Conservative, much more radical, anyway. Uh, and, uh, but I knew, and they knew me from my service in Parliament, so he was a socialist who asked me to lead the Bindi Committee. But when I finished my job, I told them, do you need anything else? No, Mr. Angelopoulos, thank you, au revoir. So I went happily back to London to my family. Um, it was not long before I started, because I felt so close to this project, I felt like I, I, I just spent so much effort and love and uh, really, I mean, hard work Nice work, but hard work. And I was seeing that the preparations, they were really stable. 
And I heard a lot of rumors from the IOC members that Greece is not on the right path. Athens um, is doing nothing. They promised a lot. The time uh, clock is ticking. Uh, we had won September 97, and actually, around 2000, three years, the then president of the IOC, Juan Antonio Samaranch, who created the huge organization that it is, the International Olympic Committee today, sponsors, money, everything, threatened that they will move the games from Athens because they were not ready and probably they should move them to Sydney. Imagine the humiliation. For me, it was nothing I could do. It was somebody else's job to run them. Um, and then, one day, I felt that it was something that I had to face that should be like one of the most difficult decisions in my life. Right at the moment when Greece stood at the edge of a total failure, the Prime Minister offered me the presidency again of the Athens Organizing Committee. Instead of seven years, that all cities have to prepare for summer games, we had only four. Um, it was uh, like someone just asked me, you know, three of the agents uh, have failed. Do you still want to fly this 747? <laughs> <laughs> to give you the sense of the project, the sense of the project I face, imagine that at the very same time, OK, let's talk about Boston. You know everything about Boston. Imagine. The same time that Boston was digging into the big dig, and I know budgets and everything and delivery times, OK, replacing Logan with a new airport, adding two new lines to the D, and two more right, uh, light railways lines out to the suburbs, widening more than 100 miles of city streets, repaving Storrow Drive, adding a steel and plexiglass roof over Fenway Park. And now, all this happening, consider that every shovel full of dirt is considered part of an archaeological site. <laughs> Wherever you dig, there is a treasure coming out. So. Deciding whether or not to accept the Prime Minister's offer was, as I say, maybe the most difficult. Actually, yes, when I married Theodore, it was an easier one. Yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, the business school actually wrote a case study about the dilemma I faced. On one hand, I was a patriot. I had helped my country host an extraordinary event. and. How could I abandon this project at its darkest point? On the other, if I took on for the games, if it was a failure, let's say, all blame would come to me. Either I deserve it or not. Whatever possibly reputation I had built should have lost. My political enemies, happy them, would um, vilify me. What should I do? OK, winning the Olympics, it was a labor of love, ladies. And part of me through it was like one of my children. I was denied the chance to raise this child once. And how could I decline this opportunity now? So I agreed, yes, to make a long story short. So four years passed, maybe some of the most significant years of my life. It was all as we raised to put on an Olympics that could fulfill the promises of our bid and dazzle the world. Doing so required building an organization that was equivalent in size and scope with one of the 200, Fortune 200 company. We found we inspired and we trained 
45,000 volunteers in a country that lacked a culture of volunteerism up to that point. How did we do it? OK, I have to make a confession. I'm a control freak. <laughs> I confess, but I don't apologize. Good leaders, I believe, pay attention to both the macro and the micro. Even while I paid attention to the big picture as president, they had to. My staff frequently found me asking about uh, the plan details, about the colors, about the volunteers, uh, uniforms, colors, about uh, whatever should dress the city with the mascots, with everything. Uh, the opening ceremony of Athens, I hope that some of you, you have watched it, and you go still go and find it, opened with a joke. We didn't show on television, though, for obvious reasons, we had a man pretending to be a workman hammering the last of the stadium, the last nails, you know, and people thought it should be serious. They finished the stadium at that moment. <laughs> so, of course, they laughed when they took off the helmet of this person, and he was the MC, the master of ceremonies, of course. Um, <laughs> but this would not be the first time uh, people they were surprised from the beginning to the end of the games. Greeks and visitors from all around the world discovered a new, a modern Greece. It was new infrastructure, new roads, new buildings. But the most important thing, people had a new attitude. Ready to serve, ready to make sacrifices to benefit the public good. I've always said, nothing is impossible. If you take your passion and you transform your energy into effort and action. And there is not to say, that's not to say that the hours, OK, imagine the hours punishing. Strain, unimaginable. Sacrifices, huge to put an Olympics in four years instead of seven. But sometimes, when something is worth it, the effort is worth it, too. The Athens Olympics were a resounding success. They were named, dreamy, unforgettable games. Modern Greece had arrived, or at least I thought it had. OK, 2013 now, almost 10 years from the Olympic Games. In the time since, the work has experienced financial shocks, recession, crisis of confidence. All of it has hit Greece especially hard. Still, I believe that the lessons of the Olympics are relevant to the fate of my country now more than ever. Like the athletes who competed in the Olympics, the Games brought out the best in us. Unlike the gold medal that athletes cherish forever, we forgot the lessons of the Olympics and Davor far too quickly. And I still believe in the power of effective leadership. I believe that leaders of countries should be encouraged to reflect on their experience when the time comes for them to transition out of power. That's why I created the Angelopoulos Global Public Leaders Fellowship at the Kennedy School. We have the first fellow here, President Felipe Calderon. I heard that he's a hit now. And uh, he joined former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright some days ago for a panel in New York in CGI program. I was like their hostess. And I remember it struck me when President Calderon talked about the difficulties that elected officials they face um, solving long term problems. I should ask you to as well when they are up for election for their next term. 
and uh, Secretary Bright spoke about the importance of shared interest over shared trust. Two groups may trust one another, but they will not be able to work together if their interests are not aligned. Similarly, two people who do not normally trust each other can work together if their interests are aligned. Secretary Sobright, uh, insight matches my own experience. I could work with anyone in Greece. I told the Prime Minister, even with the devil. No matter their party, their belief, everything, as long as they shared my commitment to delivering a successful games. So today, what Greece needs? More shared interests? More trust? What Greece needs more than anything are leaders. Leaders who can recognize shared interests and work to develop trust. I close my book with a quotation from a um, fellow Cretan. I was born in Crete, in Greece. Cretan writer, Nikos Kazantzakis, the Zorba writer. He wrote, you must love responsibility. You must say, I, I myself will save the world. If the world perishes, I will stand to blame. So that's the spirit. I believe that true leadership embodies, and that's the spirit I support here at Harvard Community. It's the spirit that I believe that my country must recapture. I know it can, and I'm happy now to answer your questions. Thank you. High heels, <laughs> spine operation, so I have to be careful. You can sit here. Which side? Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I think that was truly a, uh, an insightful and fantastic uh, set of reflections. And um, I'll, at the end, try to distill some of your uh, wisdom. Uh, but I think you. it was. I, 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 I will, I will, uh, I, I've learned a lot. What number of IQ do you really need to go? <laughs> uh, we're going to open this to questions from the audience. But before, um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, 60% of our students are women. A um, 100 years ago, every student of the first class were men. The eight members of the opening class were all men. Um, today, more than 60% of our students are women. Uh, and we see women assuming positions of leadership in an extraordinary way. We have the group of women in leadership among our students. Uh, and, and we've made an effort to, to try to promote um, uh, that, that uh, basic concept of women in leadership. And let because me ask you. Because we're better. Huh? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> in, in many Obvious. respects. Now, can you, can you share, yeah, you, you talk about this in your book as well. Yeah, of course I talk. Uh, and, and I was uh, the uh, first female president. Right. I hate that chairman, chairwoman. But anyway, <laughs> I was the leading figure of an organization. First the bidding and then the organization. I was the woman who hired the most women all around the Olympic movement uh, at that time. Why? Because I was saying, what's the criteria? I want them to have a can-do approach. To be strong, to resist pain, to be focused, and that's it. And I gave the chance to thousands of women who created their careers and proved they are capable, they are able, and they can do a lot of things for their communities and for their lives. Don't forget, 
that uh, in my book I say that my father, when his friends in Crete of 1955 were teasing him, I you don't have a son, uh, what a pity. Say, I don't need a son, I have my Jana. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly, and he told me that you can do everything you want in life, no matter what dream you have, if you just run after your dream and your goal. So, continue. <laughs> no, e e excellent. I think that's... Did you, in the process of organizing the Olympics, given that you were the first woman, did you find additional challenges? You it would have been very challenging from what you've described. But do, do you, did you feel that the fact you were a woman had posed uh, additional challenges to your leadership? From the outside, yes. If you see that as an observer, yes. But I took advantage of that. I used all my weapons, except one, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> all. As I say, we women, we can go together with men because we like each other. Let's put it this way. At least the ones that we like each other. Anyway, the thing is that, as I say, we are strong. We can be very intelligent. We can give life and we can endure pain. And in a way, we have a kind of intuition in feeling the environment. And allow me to say, sorry to say that, you men, you are so really keen to just to flattering. Yes. You cannot understand how easy it is <laughs> if you go to a man's office and just have a broken voice and say, it's up to you to make our country proud and have a, like, a nice photo op that it will go to the news of eight. You can do anything I ask <laughs> for the project. <laughs> yes, of course. I had difficulty because this. The important factor is, it's that I will never focus on them like difficulties and challenges. I try to fill the field, and it was more challenging to do something that nobody else expected that I could succeed to, into. And that, guys, is the most addicted, let's say, uh, I mean, it's an addiction in life from the good sense of the word in trying to do things that maybe nobody else tried before. And you say, I will try and do it. I will make a decision. Make fast decisions. Even, even if you are wrong, you have time to correct them with another decision. And be bold. Of course I had to break a lot of glass ceilings. Of course I had to be bold. Of course I was really, really, really persistent and I persevere. But there is no other way. Otherwise our life should be a program in the computer. Follow this, achieve that, expect that. That's it. Very nice. Uh, I, I have a twin sister, so I learned from when I was very young who was the smarter, the strongest, everything. So you don't need to convince me. <laughs> I've, I've, I've lived it. So let's open it up for, um, for questions from, from the audience. Um, please. please. And please just quickly identify yourself and tell us what program you're in at the school, if you are a student in the school. Hello. Uh, my name is Mrudu. I am an MPH student from India. Uh, I remember watching the Olympic Games uh, like in 2000 on TV and I remember being awed by the spectacle that unfolded before me. Um, my question is, um, there are a lot of stereotypes associated with women leaders, like probably like one, the one you told, like they're control freaks or they are indecisive when it comes to tough decisions. So uh, did you encounter those stereotypes uh, which other people have and how did you work with them or overcome them? I believe that the first thing is just to analyze what is your project and your goal. Which ways 
you have to approach that. And yes, if you have to be a control freak, you will not say, today I have to be calm and not to face. You have to face it. Sister, you have to go for that. If you have really to run mad everybody around and if you have to make them believe or they may share your passion or the necessity of this to be done, there are no recipes there. You will use all the weapons. Of course, I strong believe in alliances. As I told you, I was in a country, I was born in a country, that the brand, if you put, I mean, Germany, good engineers, not anymore Mexicans, I think they, they are better <laughs> engineers now. Greece, lazy, not delivering, like in cafes, sun, okay. We had to change the attitude of the people so they will support the new branding that we are can do people, people who can work hard in a disciplined way, never to be late, and also deliver a project on time for the first time in our history. We delivered projects on time and other budget. So imagine the attitude or the lack of volunteerism. How did it come in a magic way? It was like you throw a stone in a lake and then you see the circles going, 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 go reach a shore, you know. The whole palm, the whole, you feel that you transcend the society. And you will be surprised. It starts with one person like you. And you first affect a couple of people, and then five of them, and then you become 50 and 100, and then you reach thousands. And imagine the fulfillment and the pride that you will feel that I started, or I helped start that, or I was one of the first, or I participate. You know our slogan for the Olympics, for us, the volunteers, I was a volunteer, the number one, of course. Eh? I was never paid, of course. And games time, instead of my nice outfits, I had the volunteer uniform, like all the others. The slogan, it was, I was there too. Just to remember, for our kids, for our lives, of course, for our grandkids, I participated. That's great. Um, any other questions? Please. Many. Oh. Many questions. <coughs> Hi, I'm Georgia. I'm from Greece. I was in the Olympic Games in 2004. I went to the stadium three times. Well, I was uh, 13 years old at that time, and I didn't actually, I couldn't volunteer. It was very inspiring, though. But now, where our country is, I just, I just moved here from Greece, like two months ago. Do you think it was worth it? I mean, you said yourself that the culture hasn't changed. I mean, it went back to where it was before the Olympic Games. And we have a huge debt in our backs. Do you think it was worth it? Georgia, I like this question very much. Number one, I didn't say that the culture was lost. The Olympic Games, it was not just a show. Even it was not just a way to build new infrastructure and the new underground and the new airport and in a way change the view, not just for Athens, the Attica area, as we name it, and another four cities. It was the human capital that we earned. Of course, I'll go to the economic factor, but the human capital the people who changed to support a new name for their country, to be a can -do country, a competitive country, a productive country, should be the major asset, priceless. Because that was the way that Greece, with all these values, they can do the delivering on time, the team approach, the volunteerism should march into the future and should possibly 
face differently any kind of crisis. You know what it was not worth it? That we passed with the society the baton to the politicians and the politicians dropped it because it was too much work for them to maintain a country spirit like that. So they dropped the baton, they forgot the lesson and they went back to business as usual. Clientele, favors, corruption, and that's why the Greece, Greece pays the price now for bad leadership throughout decades. Now, let me tell you something about economics. Shall we clear two things? I was responsible for the Athens Organizing Olympic Organization. We had a budget 1 billion 972 million euros, almost 2 billion euros. We've done the games excellently, and I left to the next prime minister a surplus of 134 million euros. No public company ever in Greece left a surplus after a successful operation. All kind of infrastructure, they were the job of the government and any government. When a city receives the games, signs guarantees to the International Olympic Committee. Any government in four years, in seven years, guarantees will deliver. New airport, new roads, new 32 sports facilities, everything, everything. You know that nobody still says the right figure, how much they cost it? One government says six billion. The other government says, no, you spent eight billion. And the other government says, hmm, probably, and journalist, probably 10 billion. Well, I tell you that it, whatever was spent was came back through taxes, through benefits, through tourism revenues and everything. But let me tell you, let's think or let's imagine that they should be a debt. Come on, guys. We know basic math. Let's say that the debt it was, let's say, 6 billion or 8 billion to the debt crisis in Greece that started from 360 billion dollars. Give me a break. How can it affect that? So yes, Georgia, it was worth it. I still believe the plan, the planted seed is there. If it will be given the opportunity, Greeks will face their lives and their challenges differently. Um, one more question, please. Here. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Ronan is my name. I'm an MPH student from Ireland. My question is, um, considering the extremely short time you had to administer what was effectively a crisis, what was the single mm, largest setback that you had in that period and how did you deal with it? Many. Many. You know, sometimes you feel that when you do a project, it's, they are different, imagine, that you have to put different agent, engines to work. And you see that one of them is working perfectly, the other one stops, the other one stacks, the other one is being repaired but stops. And you have to put the whole thing together. Yes, <coughs> many setbacks. Actually, the major challenge, without naming you know, entities, um, the mayors or the government, the ministers, it was what I told before answering to Georgia, to bring up the culture that we needed. We needed people to show their best natures, their better angels. And I believe in human beings. I believe that all of us, we have something extraordinary inside us. The thing is that somebody has to pull it out and you have to give it. So it was times that one project was going excellently and two other projects, they were stacked. 
It was a time that I was feeling that one minister should in a way um, undermine a project if he thought that this project in his electoral part should cost him some votes. You know, things like that, that they make you crazy. I was, after the meetings, I was the only woman in an interministerial committee, a long table, the prime minister, me sitting by his right side to be close to ask questions and so on, and some socialist ministers, always. And imagine the very uh, uh, warm regards that I received sometimes from them. And after the meetings, I was telling to his office, just, I had my agenda, he has his agenda. Sometimes I say, how do you stand, Prime Minister, to have this liar, this joke? It's the third time that he came and he promised you that he will deliver, because, as I told you, the government was responsible for all kind of infrastructure projects. And one day he told me, you know, Jana, these are the people I have. I have to work with them. How you deal with that? Of course, if you ask me about the organizing committee, and if you ask me what would you do differently, yeah, don't be surprised. I should be even tougher. I was the bitch. <laughs> I knew behind me everybody named me the bitch. I was very demanding. I was crazy about deliveries. You know, the Olympics is not a project you can say, in two days we can start, guys, you know, or next month. It's by the time. And of course, we are not superstitious because you know that we started Friday the 13th <laughs> of August. <laughs> what are the odds? You have to start, let's say, 8 o'clock sharp. The world is watching. And everything has. And it's not just infrastructure. You know, this is one part. It's the human operation that you have to operate and smoothly and be decisive and to have always everybody, even my kids, they told me, Mom, don't tell us again about Plan B. Plan B or Plan C is needed. You expect to have sailing competition and to have the nice breeze and then agency is like a lake. What are you doing? <laughs> you move it, what are you doing? Or you go, canoe kayak, or you go, this kind of competition that you have here, the proud competitions between uh, Harvard and, yeah, and everything. And then you have uh, the before coming up, four to five, and you try to save the athletes. But these are the challenges that they make these projects so interesting. Thank you. We have um, time for one question. I actually, as I was listening to you right now, it occurred and you to me. I have one question. I, 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 look, I mean, what you said you built, you know, an organization that was like one of the Fortune 500 uh, or 200 you mentioned. You hire all these people. What were you? What, what did you demand from your collaborators in the in the organizing committee? What were you looking when you were hiring all the, the people? Not the volunteers, but the uh, people who work with you. Never a name, never a legend. Uh, even the director of the opening ceremonies was a very young guy, a very talented artist and director um, and um, dancer, actually. Hmm. And people, they heard and say, I mean, are you trusting the opening and closing ceremonies to this young? I say, yes, I want, I believe in him and he's the best we have and we'll make something new. So, can do approach. Contact, ice contact. Of course, I could not hire uh, 13 and a half thousand people by myself. I started with the major and I fired many of them. Yeah. You know, I was very demanding. I was organizing meetings when they should never expect to have a meeting. I had 30 directors, technology, accommodation, logistics, security, volunteerism, uh, uh, public works. So it was Tuesday, 1 o'clock. 
meeting of all of them, boardroom, everybody with the papers. The beach is there, the president, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> so I should say, um, and this is, this is, this has happened, real life. I was looking around and say, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rosakis, uh, how many volunteers uh, applications we have up to now? Trying to see his papers. I say approximately. Um, I want uh, Madam President to have the figure. Approximately 10,000, 15, 55. Uh, Somebody was passing him a paper, you know, like in exams. I've done that as well, yeah. <laughs> okay, real life, uh, Dean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we are up to 50,000 applications. I say, uh, yes, he answered me finally. Uh, the day before yesterday, it was 55,000 applications. I say, and today and yesterday, I did. I fired him. He didn't have the interest to know the whole Greece was beaming with the enthusiasm that we are seeing throughout all ages. And he didn't know the director that we had so many. Of course I fired him. <laughs> and they never regret that. <laughs> or if it had to do with anything, corruptions or even suspicion. Finish. End of story. But the eye contact, the can do approach, and as a leader, I have to tell you, because I, you have always to watch your people. Never think because you have the best plan, the best project, the best people to oversee the works, everything will go smoothly, especially in Greece. So, you appear when you, they will never expect you to appear. You will check when they will never expect you to check. You will ask questions when they will never. And this way, the whole team starts, you know, coming together. Sorry, she was asking the question, so. Last question. We're, we're out of time, which is always our tyrant here. <clears throat> So, probably it's a way to tell you also Kalispera, a Greek welcome. Um, and since you talk about Greek, I come from money. My name is Maria, and I'm a second year doctoral student in the Department of Environmental Health. Um, and I was wondering while I was listening to you, you were saying that the answer to your question was that these are the people they had to work with. And I have realized being here two years and being always proud that I am a Greek and also leaving the Olympic game in Athens and not only the games. Um, I really think that what Greece needs is us. Us to go back, us to work, and let these people that they don't really know how to get organized, how to work for their country, just, you know, put them aside, be back and work. <laughs> so I was really wondering if your phone was ringing now that you are in Boston after this, discussion and the Prime Minister of Greece or whoever from Greece ask you, Mrs. Yana Angelopoulou, can you make a team with people that you trust and come back and help? What would you be the answer then? Would you, are you going to still have dilemmas or are you going to be like, you know what, I'm going to have a bunch of people that I really trust or I can see the potential in their eyes and go back and work? Okay, Maria. Thank you. So many answers, interesting answers. Actually, I do help my country. Yesterday, it was a huge gathering, gala, in New York by Greeks abroad. Uh, and this initiative has an honorary president, President Clinton. He accepted to serve there. And it was also the Greek Prime Minister, uh, Samaras. And I'm very proud to say, and humbled, that President Clinton came to address the audience and he thanked me, Ambassador Angelopoulos, for what you're doing for your country. For people that they are not still in government and they are doing what they have to do to the society. And this is the same mantra we share with President Clinton. You finish your term, but you have to give. 
I don't need the label of the politician to give. I don't need the title. I have to be in action, have my passion, and work for my country. That's why I supported the Kennedy School, who has the motto, we are shaping the leaders of the world. That's why I supported this school here. That's why I created this program for ex-leaders to continue to serve. Look at Bill Clinton. He continues to serve. And every year, he and all the team give more to the society. That's why I asked from young Greeks, it was just an inspiration. I want to help the youth, and why not? Politicians let us down, sorry to be cruel, but I believe in young people. I ask people, young students, with feasible, doable projects that they can do affecting the society against poverty, against, I mean, help needy people, agricultural progress, public health issues. Stars they came in from all around Greece. I had to choose as a pilot program just 12. I sent them to the Clinton Global Initiative University to connect with other people that they have. And they are stars. They came back to Greece and I told them I will support you and sponsor you on the condition you will come back to our country and work for our country. This is what I'm doing. I committed this year that I will double that and I hope and I speak to people like yesterday we were with the head of Coca-Cola, who is a Turk, who is, I mean, somebody who believes in nations to be together. And I started with somebody else and say, you have to help the youth. And yes, these are projects that we don't need the label of the politician to do so. And don't forget another thing. I should mention some numbers I thought should be depressing, but people under 25 in Greece, let's imagine more than 60%, they are unemployed. And throughout my book too, I ran around America for one and a half month, May and June. You cannot imagine how many bright Greeks I've seen like you around, but how many Greeks who had to leave the country and come here. And for me, this is the major bleeding, the leak of the intellectual capital. So yes, I should help people to come back. I'm doing that so. Yes, anytime my country asked me to serve, I served as city councillor, twice as member of parliament, running for the bid, running, organizing the Olympics, whatever. And this is something that every and each one of you has to adjust to his or her position. I am committed. If you say so, it's an extra source of pride and satisfaction in life, simply as that. Well, I want to thank Ambassador Gianna Angelopoulos for these extraordinary uh, elements of wisdom. I took um, notes about some of, her, of, the, of the key messages that I, I draw from here. First, the message of seizing opportunities, but then, you know, making sure that you're empowered to be successful. The message of focus, of focusing, of paying attention to the macro and to the micro, you said, of being decisive, a breaking out of expectations, testing the limits, being decisive. And against thoughts. And against thoughts. Identifying areas of shared trust and shared responsibility. And then in this area of responsibility, taking the responsibility, the idea that it's up to me, it's up to me, I assume the responsibility. If we fail, I have failed. And if we don't fail, if we succeed, it is a shared success. And that's, I think, what characterizes uh, a wonderful leader. And we today have had an amazing, inspiring example of that kind of leadership in an area that's not ex strictly our area of public health, but what we try to show here and portray is exactly leaders, women leaders in action, making decisions and making the world a better place. So please join me in thanking Gianna Jalopoulos for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.